Luke's Gospel, chapter 20, verse 20. They watched closely and sent spies who pretended to be righteous so they could catch him in what he said to hand him over to the governor's rule and authority. They questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak, the, you speak and teach correctly, and you don't show partiality, but teach truthfully the way of God. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But detecting their craftiness, he said to them, Show me a denarius. That was their coin. Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar's, they said. Well then, he told them, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. They were not able to catch him in what he said in public, and being amazed at his answer, they became silent. May God add his blessing to the reading, the preaching, the teaching, and your hearing to understand his holy word. May Jesus Christ, our Savior, forever be praised. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We are right in the middle, I mean right smack dab in the middle, as the old folks used to say, in the middle of income tax filing season. You've got one month to go before you, the April 15th deadline, and some of you cringe about that. So when it comes to, to tax filing, there are basically two, two groups of people, two very distinct groups of folks. There are those who know that they're getting money back, and they file just as quickly as they can. I mean, January 31st rolls around, and they're at H&R Block or wherever, and they're ready to file so they can get their, their refund check back as quickly as possible. Then there are folks like me that know that they're going to have to pay in like I do every year, and I'm not stoked at all about writing the check, those two checks, one to the Fed and one to the state. So I wait until the very last day. I'm not going to give them my money until the last day that they, the, the deadline to send it in. So whichever group you're in, whether you're paying in or getting back, there's a very important, very important, somewhat surprising but absolutely biblical truth that we are confronted with this morning. Here it is. Paying taxes is a Christian duty. I say again, paying taxes is a Christian duty. Now, some of you are about right now wishing that you had just stayed at home, but stay with me. The, the truth that I'm preaching this morning are the very, is the very words of Jesus Christ. The truth I'm teaching from today, from the gospel, these are red letters, and Jesus Christ, our Savior, would not have spoken these things if it was not important, and God would not have had these words recorded and passed down to us if we didn't need to hear them today. There's a reason this is in the gospel. For those who are, are just joining us this morning, this sermon is part 96 in our journey through the gospel according to Luke. We've just been going verse by verse, line by line through the blessed gospel. The life, the ministry, the teaching, the salvation of Jesus our Lord, not, listen to me, not leaving out one single verse. The whole gospel. And so this morning we begin in the text of Scripture uh, with our points. Point number one, we consider this text historically. What's going on? Well, well this passage of Scripture, and folks, this is true of all passages of Scripture. Uh, so many times uh, the, the Bible is sort of treated like a, a grab bag, and somebody goes over here and grabs a verse, and goes over here and grabs a verse, and reaches up here and grabs a verse, then reaches back over there and grabs a poem, and mishes them all together, and, and here's the lesson. But it, look, there are no verses in the Bible. There, there are no, there's no chapters either. There's no chapters and no ver Man added those hundreds and hundreds of years later for the sake of convenience. There's no chapters, no verses. There's one story, one book. And the context of everything that came before affects the meaning of everything that comes afterwards. And so we've got to understand the historical context and not just grab a verse here and grab a verse there. The passage of Scripture this morning doesn't stand alone. 
It doesn't just arise out of nowhere without any context. We've got to remember the last few weeks. The last few weeks when we've been in chapter 19 and then going into chapter 20, we encountered a man by the name of Zacchaeus. Do you remember that about four weeks ago? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. What was the deal with Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a Jewish tax collector for the Romans. He was a Jew collecting taxes for the Romans whom they believed to be their enemy. And he climbed up in a tree and the Lord comes up to the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down. Zacchaeus gets saved. Zacchaeus gets right with God. Zacchaeus invites Jesus to his home. And people get mad because Jesus has gone to be the guest of a tax collector. That's very important to the context of this morning's sermon. Zacchaeus, tax collector... Jewish tax collector, Father Romans, who gets saved, invites Jesus over, brings the other tax collectors. They're mad at Jesus for eating and, and drinking and fellowshipping with tax collectors. What does Jesus do next? Next thing he does is he comes riding into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, and people are waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The, the leaders in Jerusalem don't like that. And they surely don't like what Jesus does next. Because the next thing, the very next thing Jesus does is he walks into the temple with an Indiana Jones whip, uh, cracking the whip and driving out the people who were in the temple, changing money and selling merchandise. And it's one of the few accounts that we see the anger of Jesus. Jesus got angry and he's run out the money changers and he's run out the merchants out of the house of God. And they didn't like that because they're, they're getting rent paid on those booths and they're getting a cut of all that's going on. And then, on, as the icing on the cake, after he's run the, the money changers and the merchants out of the house of God, then he tells a parable of, that just rubs their nose in it about them rejecting their Messiah. And they are indignant and they're mad and they're coming, trying to come up with a way to get Jesus. The Jewish leaders feel threatened by Jesus. He is jeopardizing, listen, he is jeopardizing their position. He, he is jeopardizing their position. Power. He is jeopardizing their financial prosperity. This elite group of people, this little handful of people that was in charge in Jerusalem, and they had been in charge for decades, and they had their system set up, and they were in position and power, and they had set up through the means to, to get money, whether it was skimmed off the top or gotten through other means. And here comes this guy, Jesus, and he's upsetting the whole thing. And they want to stop him. And as they have before, now they try to trap him again. So they get some folks to go up to him, and they pretend to be righteous, the text says. They pretend to be righteous. And they come up using flattery. Oh, teacher, we know that you say the truth from God. And so my Sunday school class, does that sound from Proverbs 29 this morning in Sunday school, verse 5, about... The person who flatters you, watch out, they're setting a net. Yeah, that was in Sunday school this morning, right? Oh, teacher, we know that you speak the truth from God. So, oh, great teacher, tell us, should we pay taxes? Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? It's a trick question. A trick question. They, they probably sat around all night the night before trying to come up with a trick question to get Jesus. Because if Jesus answers and says, yes, pay the evil Roman taxes, then the people are going to be angry with Jesus and they believe that the people will riot and, and Jesus will no longer be their leader. But if he says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, the Romans will arrest him for fomenting rebellion. Either way, they're done with Jesus. Brilliant plan, let's go do it. One thing, they underestimated Jesus. They just didn't know what Jesus was capable of. They didn't know that when they, they, they did, listen to me, they did not know that the one whom they were trying to trick was the one who by his very spoken word told the sun to shine. 
<laughs> they didn't know what they were doing. They, they, didn't, they got more than they bargained for is what they got. So Jesus' reply is masterful. So let me do a little historical explanation here. The denarius that he's talking about, uh, it, it was the coin of the realm. And it had the image of Emperor Tiberius, Tiberius Caesar. And an inscription on the coin that said, basically, that Tiberius was uh, a son of a god, little g god, which made Tiberius, him, they believed in, uh, that their emperors were little g gods. And that, that's what is written on the coin, Tiberius Caesar, I'm a little god. Well, that coin, because of the blasphemy on it, could not be used in the temple. So they had a different coin that was used in the temple. It was called the, the shekel or the tetradrachma, and it didn't have the blasphemous statement on it. it didn't, and it was made of silver, and, and it was uh, at least 90% silver, and so it, it was acceptable to be used in the temple. But the temple was the only place where that specific coin was used. The denarius that Jesus asked for has... The picture of Caesar and the statement with Caesar's name and him saying, I'm a little God. So Jesus gives him the answer. He says, let me see the denarius. Okay, whose picture's on it? Whose name's on it? Boys and girls, and then grown-ups, do so you remember this? When you were in school, you, you come into school and, and, uh, and you got your lunch box or your brown paper bag and your teacher says, put your name on it, um, you got a new jacket for Christmas, and it was the popular one that everybody wanted, so the first day you go back to school, your mother gets the permanent marker on the inside collar, right, sure, because your name on it signifies that it's mine, right, okay, so Jesus says, all right, who, who claims to own this, well, Tiberius Caesar, give it back to him, his name's on it. If he says it's his, give it back to him. Jesus' answer in that short little phrase, to render unto Caesar, as the old King James says, that which is Caesar's, and render unto God that which is God's, the short phrase is, he's saying to them, hey guys, look, the Romans are in power. The Roman emperor has his name on the coin. The Roman military and the Roman tax collectors are operating under the authority of that emperor whose name is on that coin. And the whole economy that we have operates with the money with that guy's name and face on it. If it's his, give it to him. And they're just dumbfounded. That, that's not what they were expecting. L look at verse 26. Verse 26, they were not able to catch him in what he said in public, and being amazed at his answers, they became silent. And good riddance. Huh? L listen, be become silent sometime. When you're, when you're proven wrong, when, you have, when you're proven wrong, when your plot is found out, zip it up. Don't keep digging the hole deeper and deeper. Okay, so that's the historical background. We consider the text historically. Number two, we consider the text ethically. Ben Franklin, y'all are familiar with Ben Franklin. Great quotes from Ben Franklin. Uh, the phrase that you've heard many, many times, that in this world, the only thing that is certain are death and taxes, originated with Ben Franklin. And that's true, <laughs> death and taxes. And it's true about the, the, you know, the IRS has what it takes. They do. They really do. The, I, the Internal Revenue Service has what it takes. They have what it takes to take what you have. I understand your disdain for paying taxes because I have the same disdain. It's understandable, especially we were talking about this in the prayer meeting before Sunday school. It is especially disdainful when we see the wasteful spending, when we see the fraud, when we see the corruption, when we see the abuse. I mean, it just makes my blood pressure go up. And just keeping up with, with state government, the legislature this past week, making final decisions, I just had to finally quit reading some of the stuff. It, it makes me unhealthy. That's my money you're wasting. 
right? You, you do that. Even, even the children pick up on it. Kids pick up on this really quickly. Uh, there was a, a Sunday school teacher, and it was, it was around Christmas time, and uh, she had a, a children's Sunday school class, and uh, it, the week before they had looked at the passage from Luke chapter 2 and, uh, and why Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem because Caesar Augustus had issued the uh, decree that the whole world should be taxed. So the following week, she asked the, the boys and girls in the class to review to see if they remembered what they learned their last week. She said, boys and girls, Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem because who, who was it that said that the whole world should be taxed? And one little boy stood up, and with all the angst that a little boy could, and probably muster, and probably imitating his father and mother that he had sir, heard say it, the Democrats. <laughs> or if that's not your brand, the Republicans. The whole world should be taxed. Well, the whole world is taxed, and forever will be until the Lord returns. We have disdain for, for these taxes. Folks, we don't have to like it. But the fact remains that paying our taxes is our Christian duty. And if you listen very carefully, and everyone out there in Internet world on YouTube that will watch this later, if you are cheating on your taxes, you are sinning. If you are hiding income, you are sinning. If you are claiming deductions that are illegal, you are sinning. You're sinning. There's just no other way around it. Jesus makes it absolutely clear in this scripture, but he's not the only one. The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul reinforces the idea in Romans 13. You might want to write this passage down. Romans 13, verses 6 and 7. The Apostle Paul says, This is also why you, this is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing, give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. That's what the Bible says. So let me give you some Christian ethics on taxes, okay? And now ethics have to be worked through a paradigm is what it's called. And, and so just you don't have to understand any of that. I've done it for you. Aren't you glad? This week, I worked through a Christian paradigm of, of ethics to come to these conclusions. So I don't have to show you all the paperwork and charts and graphs behind it. You're just going to take my word for it? Okay, good, good. That'll make it simpler. We'll get home sooner. Here's some Christian ethics on taxes. Under our current system, you should try to pay the least amount of taxes that you legally can. Let me say that again. Under our current system, you should try to pay the least amount of taxes that you legally can. Take your deductions. Keep up with your contributions. Jump through every legal loophole that you can. Honestly jump through. Pay what you owe, but not more than what you owe. Pay your taxes. Pay what you owe, but not more. There are, there are so many Christian folks that don't take their deductions and don't do their mileage and don't do all that stuff, and they're missing out. Pay what you owe, but not more than you owe. Pay the least amount of taxes that you legally can. Number two, use your voice and your vote to influence how our elected leaders spend and use the taxes. Okay? This is a democracy. This is a democratic republic. Christian ethics says that we should use our voice and our vote to influence our elected leaders about taxes and how they're spent. Number three. Number three. Taxes should be simple, low, and evenly applied. Taxes should be low, simple, and evenly applied. And they are none of those things right now. E evenly applied, equitably applied. Exodus, listen, you've never read this before if you haven't read all the way through the Bible. Exodus 23 teaches us not to, not to show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the rich. Taxes should be equally applied. Equally applied. Lastly, 
the Apostle Paul, in the book of Acts, he exercised his rights as a Roman citizen. He, he said the phrase, Civitas Romanus, I am a Roman citizen. You can't beat me without a trial. And they knew it was true. He used his rights as a Roman citizen, and so should you. You should, you should use your rights as an American citizen. You, here's what I'm saying. You have a right as an American citizen to get and to use what your tax dollars have paid for. Now, I'll work these things through the Christian paradigm of Christian ethics for you. Take my word for it. Apply these things. Okay. So we consider the text historically, we consider, consider it ethically, lastly, lastly, we consider it spiritually. Jesus. Jesus said more than just render unto Caesar, didn't he? He said more than just render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. He also said, give unto God that which is God's. So what is God's? Remember what I told the boys and girls, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything we lay claim to one day will belong to somebody else or be ashes and dust. That's right. You don't own anything. It all belongs to God. It all belongs to God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Don't you know that your body is the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have heard from? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. It all belongs to God. We belong to God. All of our income ultimately is His. Now, He lets us use it, but He requires, he requires of us the tithe, the first tenth of all our income. You do notice that, that God in, is in favor of a flat tax. Right? God supports the flat tax plan. So that's who we need to be looking for, people that support a flat tax plan like the Bible says. Ten percent is good enough for God. It ought to be enough for Uncle Sam. So it all belongs to God, and we honor God by bringing to God the first tenth of all that we earn. Historically, ethically, spiritually. W.C. Fields, anybody familiar with W.C. Fields? He was a, um, an actor, vaudeville comedian uh, of a bygone era, and he was also a very famous a uh, atheist, probably the most famous atheist of the era, of that vaudeville era. Well, someone once, once caught him reading a Bible, and they asked him, why in the world are you reading the Bible? And W.C. Fields says, I'll do my best impersonation here, okay? I'm looking for a loophole. Hey, folks, there are plenty of loopholes in the IRS tax, tax code. If you've got to, you pay enough money for the right CPA or lawyer to find that you can find your loopholes. There are no loopholes in the Bible. The, the tax code is full of loopholes. This one has none. John chapter 3, Jesus said, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Must be born again. Have you been born again? Are you saved? I'm not asking you the question, are you a Christian? Because that's too easy to answer. I'm asking you, do you know that Jesus is your Savior and that heaven will be your home? Look, you're not going to be able to stand at the pearly gates of heaven and have some loophole worked out. There are going to be two responses, one of two responses that you're going to hear. When you stand at the pearly gates, you will either hear, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Or you will hear, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Enter into the glory of thy Father's kingdom. You must be born again. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. A-L-L-L. -L -L. The Bible says the wages or the cost of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, 
Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says, what are you waiting for? Rise up and be baptized, washing away your sins by calling upon his name. There are no loopholes. No loopholes. Wrapping it all up. Do what's right. We have an obligation to pay the taxes. You say, but our government's so evil. Our government's not as evil as the Romans was, as the Romans were. You have a duty. Don't cheat. You, it's God's anyway. It belongs to him. He's going to work it out. He's going to work it out. Lastly, don't leave here today thinking you're going to find a spiritual loophole. Trust and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that everyone in the sound of my voice have taken heed to your word and now will respond in faith to it. Have your will and have your way in this invitation, we ask in Jesus' name.